It is good to be together tonight. Christmas is, of course, a time of anticipation. I remember being young and having anticipation about what presents were there for me. You grow a little bit, and with eager anticipation, you look forward to gifts given and what that means for others. Of course, we celebrate the coming of Messiah, that much anticipated event that the Old Testament looked forward to that humanity desperately needed. And our world around us lives in anticipation during this season, looking forward to meals and time with family and a break from work. There are much bigger things that we anticipate as believers. We anticipate thinking back to the first coming of Messiah. And now we also anticipate the second coming of Messiah. To be a Christian is to live between advents, comings of the Messiah. It is a fundamental belief in monumental historical events. The sovereign orchestrator of human history penetrated human history, and he will do so again. And while the world goes on and humanity cycles through its ups and its downs, Humanity ignores critical events that ought to stop every human in his tracks. The first coming of the world's Messiah went largely unnoticed by the world. The rescuer, the hope of Israel, the light of the Gentiles, the one who paid the debt of sin, the one who brings world peace, who crushes the serpent, who ends the curse, who rights all wrongs and terminates death and suffering and pain. He came. He came unnoticed, incognito. His arrival was missed and maligned and marginalized, but monumental nonetheless. His second arrival will not be incognito. When he comes to the earth again, every eye will see him. Every heart will be held account to him. As a Christmas Eve meditation, I want to turn your attention to the last book of your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, uh, we do have some here. I'd love for us to have our eyes on Revelation chapter 12 this evening. So you can turn in your own copy of Scripture to that, or these men, just put your hand up. These men will put a Bible in your hands. I'm going to read the entire chapter of Revelation 12 and briefly highlight a few of its details. This is God's word. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars, and she was with child. And she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns. On his heads were seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And she gave birth to a son, a male, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne." Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there was no place found for them in heaven any longer. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he only has a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. 
And the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman so that he might cause her to be swept away with a flood. But the earth helped the woman. The earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of his mouth. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Revelation chapter 12 is a subplot in the unfolding narrative of Revelation, that last book of the Bible, which deals with future events, the culmination of human history and God's bringing his plan to its full. It is a sweep of meta-history taking us back to the birth of Christ and forward to his return and many tumultuous events in between. There are symbols in this book, in this book of Revelation, and thankfully the author gives us an indication when symbols are being used. Here he introduces this chapter by saying a great sign. And the sign in verse one is a woman, that is Israel. In verse two, it is a child, that is Christ or Messiah. In verse three, it is a great dragon, that is Satan. In verse four, there is cosmic rebellion and Satan's murderous intent. He wants to snuff out Messiah. He has wanted to eliminate the seed line of the promise from the first opening pages of our Bibles where God promised a son of the woman would crush the snake. He has attempted ever since to interfere with that. Here he is pictured as waiting for the child to be born that he might devour the child. And then in verse five, look at it again. She gave birth to a son, a male, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, literally to shepherd the nations. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And, and there we have in verse five encapsulated the coming of Jesus Christ the first time. His birth on the earth as a child and the intention of his coming, which is still yet future to shepherd or to rule the nations, all the nations, with a rod of iron. And then you have in verse five, his ascension, he was caught up to God and to his throne. And while Satan certainly had murderous intent, his plans were foiled, ironically, by the supernatural, unpredictable plan of God by the death of the very one he attempted to murder. The seed of the woman came to die, not yet as conquering king and ruler of all the nations, but as the suffering servant we just heard from the prophet Isaiah, to bear the iniquities of God's people, to be crushed by his father, to justify the many. And that unpredictable plan was the rescue of sinners unto God. We find ourselves in the middle of verse five between two advents, the, the coming of Christ the first time to pay for sin and the return of Christ the second time to rule the nations. As this chapter unfolds, we saw Satan's anti-Semitism culminating at the end of human history and God's preservation of his people. You see the nation of Israel fleeing from the land of Israel, just as Jesus said they would in Matthew 24 and the prophet Zechariah promised in Zechariah 14. There is heavenly warfare of spiritual powers. There is a day yet coming, future from our perspective, where Satan will be cast out of the heavenlies and no longer have access to the throne room of God to make accusations against God's people. That day will come, and when that day comes, we know the kingdom is soon, and Satan's time will be short. Then his fury will be focused to the earth, and so God says, woe to the earth at that time. Those who overcome by the blood of Christ in that era, who do not count their lives as precious, but are losing their lives to gain eternity, will be preserved as conquerors. At the end of the chapter, a more detailed look emerges of that last satanic Jewish persecution and God's preservation. 
And then notice verse 17. When Satan can't extinguish God's people Israel, he goes after the rest of her children. Who is that? Verse 17. Non-Jews who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Even in those last days, the days of Israel's purging and repentance and belief of the gospel, there will be Gentiles who believe and are rescued by God as well. Those days for us are yet future when the shepherd of the sheep comes to shepherd the nations. We live between the time when he came as a sheep to be slaughtered and the time when he will come to shepherd all people. In the first advent, Jesus came incognito and sins were paid for. In his second coming, he will come very much cognito to give a reckoning to the world. For the world, a night like tonight, Christmas Eve, is an evening of anticipation. For Christians, this brief lifetime, which is but a vapor, is a lifetime of anticipation, saying, come, Lord Jesus, praying, your kingdom come. This is our heart. This is our hope. If your sins are not forgiven, friend, and you're here tonight, you are not prepared for second advent. You must be prepared by the first advent and have your sins forgiven by placing your faith in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone to take away your sins and to make you right before a holy God. If you are not clothed in the righteousness of Christ, purchased by his blood at the cross, you will only stand prepared for judgment when he comes again. But if you will open your life, surrender yourself to Christ, even this evening, you will have the promise and guarantee of forgiveness of sin, eternal life, and a joyous anticipation of his return. If you would like to know more about what it means to be a Christian, to be ready for Christ's second coming, would you turn to somebody this evening? Ask, how do I become a Christian? How do I know this Christ? Talk to anybody you've seen up here on the stage. Talk to the people next to you. We would love to talk to you about how to know him. We're gonna pray and sing one final closing song. Lord Jesus, we do pray that you would come quickly. Our world is under your Father's curse. It is marred by the pollution of our sins personally, individually, and corporately. And there is no hope in this world for its remedy. But you have promised to turn swords into plowshares. You have promised to reverse the curse. You have promised to end the tyranny and the dominion of sin. You have promised to end death. Lord Jesus, we anticipate your return. We long for your return. We, your people, are restless and homesick until you come. And we sing, even with this eager anticipation, these words for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.